Hello and welcome to a rather drastic haircut and a rather drastic and exciting opening, the Budapest. Um, such a fun opening to have in your repertoire and such a fun opening to play. Uh, an opening, I have to admit, that I haven't had the chance to play yet, but I, after studying and preparing all the work for this DVD, I, I'm savouring the opportunity I play in my next tournament. Maybe by the time this DVD is out, I would have had some amazing wins with the opening. So what is the Budapest and, and what do you have in store for you uh, during the course of this uh, DVD? Well, uh, the Budapest is really starts on move two. So after the moves d4, we continue with knight to f6. And after the main and most popular move, c4, we now play this drastic and exciting gambit pawn to e5. And this is the start of the Budapest. Now, I'm going to tell you my personal thoughts on this opening. Uh, I want to be as honest as I can. I, I generally try to be in everything I do, and I back that up with the hardest prep I can find and, you know, computer-generated stuff and lots of resources as well I've looked at. I mean, let's just mention some of the resources that have helped me along the way here. Uh, first of all, uh, Moskalenko's book, The Fabulous Budapest Gambit, very good book on the Budapest. I think he's a little bit optimistic at times about Black's chances, but that's a good way to sell stuff. Um, I'll probably be a bit optimistic as well. Uh, Timothy Taylor did a very interesting book on the Budapest as well, which I looked at. And then you have other online resources, which I've used. And of course, Chessbase with their uh, incredible database as well. Now, um, one thing I, I would like to mention straight away, and I, I'm, I'm going to get any sort of negatives out of the way uh, already. Uh, one thing that puts a lot of people off the Budapest is that after the move D4, knight to f6, white has a couple of ways to avoid the Budapest. Uh, for example, if white plays the London system with bishop to f4, you, you have to have another repertoire here. London system becoming increasingly popular now. And then you have knight to c3, a bit of a rarer move, but of course this avoids our gambit as well. And maybe one of the most annoying moves is knight to f3. So one thing just to bear in mind is the Budapest, I, I believe, is a great weapon to have, a brilliant surprise weapon, and you can always hope on move two, play c4, which most players do play. Um, but it's also good to have another backup opening uh, as well. And, you know, I, I was thinking of what works well with the Budapest in this Gambit style. And there's a number of options. You know, you have to make your own decision there, really. And these are all sidelines. But this DVD is, of course, concentrating on this position, which is uh, you're most likely to get this in most of your games. Now, what are the pros of this exciting move? Well, generally, the move D4 and move 1 leads to quiet positional slow games where unlike e4 openings which are a lot more dynamic in nature d4 is longer drawn out games and players on the white side who want to play d4 don't really want to get involved with any tactical operations they don't enjoy getting attacked they don't enjoy you know giving their opponents the initiative because they play d4 they want a quieter game um so you're taking the game directly to them as we're going to see quite shortly, um, there are many trappy lines. So it's one of those things where if white's not well prepared, white can get absolutely destroyed very quickly. Even if white is incredibly well prepared and at the highest levels, the Budapest, I would say, is on the verge of being equal. And a lot of the lines, you get this dynamic positions in the Budapest. I mean, we're going to go through in this introduction the main setups that you'll generally face. But there's so many interesting and exciting possibilities that Black has in the Budapest, unlike other openings. It's one of those openings that should bring back the joy of chess to you. So even if you don't play the Budapest in all your games, or if you do, it's one of those openings where it's good for us as a chess player. It's an opening that should just show us the joy of chess, excite us again, like the King's Gambit, like these other romantic openings 
an opening which gives us the initiative. So it helps us learn how to attack. And this is a key thing for a lot of players. I think the Budapest would be ideal for players who are a bit stuck in their ways. So, for example, players against D4 who generally play more positional games and they want to revitalise their chess. What better than playing an exciting gambit and getting the initiative very early? And one thing that E5 does do is gain the initiative. And this is a key, key factor. Black relies on fast peace development, creating threats very quickly and interesting kingside attacks. Again, we'll, we'll look at the strategic elements of this opening uh, very soon. So, OK, um, the way I've basically uh, done this DVD, I've started by, we'll go over the introduction, and I'm, in the introduction I'm going to show you the four main responses that White has to the Budapest in this position. I'll talk about them in a second, not in a lot of detail, but I'll give you a little, uh, a little taster. Um, and after we've done that and talk about the history and some things like that, I'm going to tell you what I believe are the, some of the main strategic ideas you need to know. So what ideas you should be trying to achieve as black and what ideas you need to watch out for. We're then going to have a look at some of the biggest traps you can get in the Budapest because many there are many exciting traps which white can fall into. And this is one of the main attractions of this opening. Some people say it's a trappy opening. Well, it is a trappy opening. And, you know, like I say, at super grandmaster level, the Budapest is not so common. But recently it has been played by such mavericks as Mamadarov, a ritual report. And, um, you know, Nigel Short even used it in his world championship candidate match against um, uh, Antoli Karpov. So it's a great weapon to have. Now, going back to the Budapest, um, let's just have a look at the scores, the percentages, uh, you know, up to sort of recent times. Well, it scores about 30% about black wins, 44% white wins and 21% draws. Now, I would say the reason it's quite heavily favoured in white side is because often the players playing it as black are much lower rated than the white players. So as we know, all statistics can be wrong and distorted and they don't give a fair view. Um, but one thing I think is very noticeable, and again, another attraction, is the particular low percentage of draws. You know, if you play the Budapest, a draw, you're sort of saying, come on, I don't want to draw back, I want to win. So this is an exciting opening. I mean, Bovis, Boris Averuk, one of the most respected opening writers, said about the Budapest, uh, and I think this sums it up reasonably well, the Budapest Gambit is almost a respectable opening. Now, don't get too depressed, by the way. I doubt there is a refutation. Yeah. Even in the lines where white manages to keep an extra pawn, black always has a lot of play for it. And that sums it up. You get the initiative. You get long-term initiative. Now, the computer may dislike a lot of the main lines, give them a half a point edge to white. But, it, you know, computers don't always evaluate the human essence and the how strong the initiative is in human play. And we've got to bear that in mind throughout this. It, it was first played um, in, the, in Budapest, hence the name, in 1896 between Adler and Moroxi. Moroxi, the first player to play the Budapest Gambit. And the Adler variation is one of the first variations we'll look at in, in that game. Um, other players who developed it were Hungarians, uh, had some Hungarian players, hence why the Budapest, again, is quite an appropriate name. And nowadays, there, like I said, there has been a bit of a surge recently with some, some of the more exciting players playing it. And I think it's due another surge um, in competition. So after the move E5, really the only critical move here is capturing on E5. Now, other moves we'll look at at the end of this uh, DVD. But if white doesn't capture the pawn on E5, then black can be, you know, equal immediately. Uh, white can try moves like d5, bishop c5 is a very good move, I actually prefer black here, and other moves are just very passive here, like knight to f3 and e3, so we won't deal with them yet. And after the capture on e5, what we're mainly concentrating on in this DVD is the pure Budapest, and that is the move knight g4. 
because this gives us the opportunity of winning our pawn back. And um, we're going to do this by increasing the pressure on that pawn with our other knight coming out. And really one of the things we, which, again, I, I like about the Budapest is how quickly our pieces come into the game. Our bishop has the c5 square in some lines, and it also has a very useful check on b4. Now, generally, if white's pawn was back on c2 in, in this kind of position, the Budapest would be a lot less effective. The pawn on c4 does give white some positional influence on the centre, but also it weakens a lot of squares. So all these ideas, you can even other ideas to bear in mind that we're going to, you know, uh, obviously look at in more detail a bit later on. Uh, as well as this quick piece development, our ideas of playing d6 and f6 at some moment in time. Both of these moves here will aim to give up a, a pawn properly, but increase our development as we go along. Um, so another thing we will have a quick look at as a bonus to this DVD is the move knight to e4. And this is the so-called... and I'm sorry about my pronunciation, uh, Fajarovic variation um, had its origins in, I think, the German town of Leipzig. And this it was first played in 1928. And this is a really tricky move that White has to deal with. Now, I do believe White has ways to get an advantage against this move. But this is, again, a move you might want to play on those rare occasions where you need to go all in and you think your opponent is not you know it's I mean, if your opponent is not prepared for this move it's extremely dangerous so this is a bit of more of a gambit line because you can't win the pawn back in the budapest you generally win the pawn back but in this line you're saying i don't want the pawn back i want to i want to really go for quick development so we'll have a look at that at the end of this dvd um so after knight g4 what moves does white have here well the first time this was played, like I said, in 1896. Adler against Moroxy played knight to f3. And this is a very sensible and decent developing move. Hence the Adler variation, because we're developing and we're defending. And this move, as we're going to see later on, uh, and we'll come to this, talk about it a bit more, uh, you know, uh, when we get to that section, often involves black using a rook side man king side maneuver now that looks ridiculous in this position but it, it's a very exciting idea combined with a5 and black often gets good attacking practical chances um white has a couple of ways to play the positions we're going to look at in these lines one of them is to try an idea i think it was maybe spasky who first tried it with an f4 move later on when the knight takes on this square and also ideas with c4 c5 but again this may be a bit mystical and magical at the moment we'll, we'll look at these a bit later on now after knight to f3 what should we do well bishop c5 is the move that i'm going to mainly be recommending in this position why why this move here well this move forces white to play e3 and that's because we're attacking f2. Uh, there's not really another way that white can play here. The move knight to d4 uh, actually fails to a little tactic here. I mean, there's a number of good moves, but knight takes f2, followed by queen h4, and knight to c6 is already winning for black. Now, if we just talk about this knight to f3 move, one of the most popular ways nowadays, and probably the theoretical recommendation in this position for white is to play bishop to f4 first. And this is the Rubenstein variation. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is that after this move, and now knight c6 or bishop b4 generally lead to the same sort of thing. Uh, the modern variation g5, I don't have a lot of faith in, and I'll discuss that a bit later on. But let's just talk about general principles for now. After a move like this, um, the point is that if we ever play bishop c5, then white now has developed his bishop outside the pawn. So this is a much superior um, method of playing compared to the Adler variation, 
which in the Adler variation, the bishop is on c1 and often come to b2. But here the bishop is already quite active. So putting our bishop on c5 in the Rubenstein variation doesn't make as much sense. What other options? What I mean, I said there were four main options. So after this knight g4, we've already discussed the Adler, the Rubenstein. And another main option here is the Alakine variation with e4 going for a space advantage and returning the pawn immediately. The main idea being, if we take on e5, then there's this f4 move. And white says, have your pawn back. I'm getting a lot of space. And look at those three pawns. They look quite scary. And this is the line I, I also play as white. Now, how do we fight against this idea with black? Well, one of the problems with white's position is that some of the squares are now a little bit weakened and diagonals because of these pawns moving up the board. So again, as in the Budapest, we often play of our pieces. It's an opening we use our pieces in regularly. And in this position, I'm recommending maybe not one move which is considered the main option, but knight g6. I think this is the most aggressive line, keeping pressure here, combined with a bishop b4 check and quick development. Quick development is how we're fighting against this idea of whites and white has to be very careful in these lines bishop b4 castles this kind of thing will be coming up the other line which i would say is a main line after knight g4 is the line which has proved to be quite popular i think it had a, a, a resurgence in popularity in um about the 1980s this unassuming move e3 and white came up with the idea that after knight takes e5 of now playing knight to h3, trying to move this knight towards the center, actually in Maroxy bind style. And this is another opening which is quite interesting, but I don't think it's a real threat. I think black has a couple of ways to be equal. We can stick with a traditional bishop b4 check, which I think is the best and most active move. Or you can even play g6 here if you like these kind of fianchetto positions, but we're gonna look at bishop b4. So I would say the two main lines we need to really look at are knight to f3 and bishop to f4. So after knight to f3, we now take the opportunity to play bishop c5 because this forces the move e3. And after the move e3, we now develop another piece with knight c6 when we are attacking this pawn and... Uh, I'm going to win this pawn back. Now, there are a couple of ideas here for white. And again, let's talk briefly about the, the ideas both sides have. Mainly white wants to put the bishop on this diagonal on b2. I mean, originally it, a3 was suggested as a good move for white, but then it, it started to shift that actually the moves a3 and a5 actually help black because of this reasonably modern manoeuvre of bringing the rook all the way to a6 and then to h6, which is one of the most attractive ideas in the Budapest, to attack white on h2 when white castles. So a3, a5, and let's just have a look at this. Let's say b3, castles. One thing, again, I'd like to note here is that you often only take on e5 once bishop b2, bishop e2 has been played. There's no particular rush to play that. Well, why is that the case? Because in some variations, if we take there immediately, white can play f4 when we move our knight somewhere. The bishop doesn't have to go to e2. It can go to d3, and it keeps better control of the center. So we only want to take the pawn on e5 when white has already put the bishop on e2 because then if it moves to d3 white loses the tempo uh, but after some moves here like b3 castles uh bishop b2 rook e8 knight knight c3 knight takes e5 bishop e2 this line with a3 a5 is considered to be quite okay for black because of rook a6 and this is so much fun for example if white castles blindly, rook to h6, and with the queen coming to h4, this can be incredibly dangerous. And I, I'm going to stick with this maneuver through throughout this course because I know a lot of you guys watching this. There's a wide range of elos, but you know this is 
a lot of club players and this is a very effective plan you know it this you know more you're not going to have many gms buying this dvd but for club players this idea is a great way to learn how to attack and to enjoy your attacking chess i mean let's just say we get this move in some of the dangers that can be shown here involve the bishop on c8 and even a move such as d5 here and bishop takes h3 can be devastating devastating attack with black's pieces rushing in so talking about the adler variation and i suppose we could say this is one of the main positions in the adler uh a3 then was seen to be a waste of time for white and instead of a3 the move bishop e2 um was played and now we castle we could take on e5 here and actually this this move taken on e5 we'll have a look at in the theory section we'll have a look at what i think is the best line but the main line is castles castles here and now rook to e8 and you know after knight c3 the rook is very useful here knight takes e5 knight takes e5 knight takes e5 this is one of the main positions in the budapest uh, white generally has two plans here one is the spasky plan of king h1 and f4 but this is not so scary and the other one is to, for white to play b3 bishop b2 and to play like this with the knight coming to harass our bishop and this is quite an annoying maneuver for us on the other hand we are going to have a look at what black should be doing here and really have i would say two main ideas of course the a5 rook a6 idea is something i'm sure you'd like to try out and we'll, we'll come to this very shortly another way to play this one is to play the rook e6 rook h6 idea and in order to do this you should probably go d6 and bishop d7 first and then you can try getting this rook over here so a lot of rooks coming that way so we'll come to the adler variation all this very shortly Okay, so let's now discuss, I think we've talked enough about the Alakine, uh, and we'll come on to E4 later on. What about the Rubenstein then, which is what most top players as white are playing at Grandmaster level and above. So this is probably the move which we need to respect the most, uh, theoretically at the moment. Now, against this, there has been a real surge in in recent ish years for black playing the move g5 now this is again a, another really good side weapon but i'm not going to be concentrating on this move and the reason for that is i i think and i i well i don't think i know um that it's probably a bit dubious number one if white knows what to play Obviously, white might get confused here and not know this g5 move, but we don't want to gamble that. We want to gamble that white's going to play the best moves. Of course we do. And there was a game that we're going to see where Mamajarov played this and lost in quite simple fashion where white just played the best moves. So I don't believe this move is correct. And the other reason is I want to keep this repertoire as simple for you as I can so you can learn it easily. And I want to suggest setups where you generally are playing knight c6 and bringing the bishop to b4 check or to c5. I don't want to overcomplicate by learning some long theoretical lines with g5 here. So that's why I'm concentrating on um, the move knight c6 here. Now, an interesting option is bishop b4 check and then playing d6. But again, this is a line that, a gambit line, where if white knows what to play with computer analysis and the latest theory, white's just better. So again, I don't want to give you a line that white is just clearly better and you don't have those dynamic chances. I mean, this is, again, a very tricky line, but we can't just rely on tricks. I'll have a little look at this in case you want to give it a go. But my main suggesting here is just to play knight c6. I want to keep it simple. We want to win our pawn back and develop quickly now bishop c5 in these lines doesn't really have as much point now that the bishop's out on f4 um but after knight to f3 we should go for bishop to b4 check and this is i suppose the start of the rubenstein 
where white has two main moves here. Now, that is bring this knight out to d2 or to c3. Now, a lot, again, at grandmaster level, a lot of a lot of games go knight d2. I mean, also knight c3, to be fair. Now, what is the difference between these two moves? Well, with knight d2, white is generally saying, OK, look, you can have the pawn back on d5 because white can no longer bring the queen to d on e5 excuse me white can no longer bring the queen to d5 to defend this pawn which he can if he puts the knight on c3 so white's saying you know have the pawn back but i'm going to uh gain the bishop pair because you're going to often have to give your bishop up hoping to get a small advantage in those lines black is very solid though and, and it's not clear white has much of anything now, knight c3, you could say, is a bit more of a stern test of this variation because here black won't get the pawn back. I mean, again, one move, another move we often rely on is queen e7. So, for example, we should double those pawns at some point, play queen e7. Now, if we can win the pawn back here, we'll probably be better because of the structure. But now, queen d5 is possible. And in this position here, I believe the best move is f6. So it's a pure pawn sacrifice, but after pawn takes, knight takes f6, we certainly have compensation. Now, the computer thinks white is better on these lines, but again, this is where a human and computer will have to disagree. White has to play very accurately. White has long-term problems with these guys on the queen side. And also, black has this extra tempo in these positions, queen d3 and g3 being the best setup that white has here. And again, we'll look at this later on. But this this is a very important line here. Uh, Aronians played this as white recently, and Avanchuk has been trying this out with the black side. Um, now, after knight on b to d2, so after this check, this is the other mainish stuff we need to look at, knight b d2. What's our, our main emphasis here? Well, queen e7. F6 has been tried, but again, it, it's not really that believable. And after queen e7, the main line now goes a3. Um, white can also go e3 here, but a3. And now the very nice trick, uh, knight takes e5. And we'll come to this in a second. I'll let you think about this for a moment. Knight takes e5, knight takes e5, pawn to e3. And the main position we're concentrating on is bishop takes d2 check. And this is where white hopes to get that small advantage here with the two bishops. But black is incredibly solid. And I don't think white necessarily wants to have this pawn on a3 sometimes because it's harder to go b3 and stabilize. So these positions are very okay for black. Now, another line we will look at, because I'm sure a lot of you playing the Budapest want something a bit more fun, is a suggestion of Timothy Taylor in his book. And this is a suggestion rather than taking on d2 of playing bishop c5. And this is quite a wild suggestion. And again, I, I think this is a, a line which a lot of you might find very attractive because the point is, if b4, which is a move a lot of players on the white side might want to play, Timothy Taylor points out we have bishop to d4. And this is a very fun and, and less explored variation. If you take this, there's two checkmates. I'm sure you can both see them. And if rook b1, just d6. And this is a very bizarre line where we leave our bishop hanging on this square. It's, it's a really interesting way to play. And after bishop e2, and this is not uh, white's best moves, but... Bishop f5 now comes. And, and this is the kind of thing, again, I, I, this bishop c5 move is a very tricky line. Uh, and I want to give the opportunity of playing these tricky lines uh, as much as you can, as it's the Budapest, mainly a surprise weapon after all. And after rook b3, now knight g6. And actually around here, it's black who's starting to gain a very good position. Uh, this bishop should move. And now just bishop f6 or even bishop e5, both of these moves... I think give black a very, very good game with these dynamic bishops and ways to hit the white queen side with a5. So, uh, you know, I mean, other things I should mention, I mean, after this knight g4 move, if white tries to hang on to the pawn with some queen move, 
then we will always gain very, very good play with d6. This queen is really exposing itself. But for this introduction, I, I've tried to give you a bigger overview of everything I've learned without going into too much theory. And the way we're now going to structure the rest of this course is we're going to look at some strategic ideas. I don't want to overwhelm you. Some traps, lots of fun to look at. And then we're going to looking at these main ideas one at a time with games and theory. And I hope you'll enjoy this. And this has been one of my favourite DVDs to film, actually, funnily enough. I mean, you know, I, I, the Budapest, I, I'm going to be totally honest, it's not something I play all the time, but it's something that is great to have. I mean, especially at, even at my level, Grandmaster level, if I was playing in tournaments, if I can throw the odd Budapest gambit into my chess base database, when my opponent's preparing for me, they have to prepare against the Budapest. So they're going to have to spend a lot of time finding all these lines. If your opponent doesn't have a chance to prepare, then I think the Budapest, they won't be that well prepared for it. So it's quite a rare opening and you can score some great victories. So it's a real fun gambit line and it will be, I think, a very attractive variation for a number of you to add to your tress. Ch tress? What's tress? Tress. Don't know. Chess repertoire. OK, well, I think that's all I'm going to talk about now, as, as I've already mentioned. And we will uh, now have a look at some of the main strategic ideas. <laughs> 